Good afternoon, everyone. Translation English. Uh, this week we are delving deeper into the subject to discuss the elements of the picture. Given that this is a broad area of subject today, and then we'll be taking other parts um, in the next week. Our objectives for today's discussion will be to understand what is meant by elements of the picture. And then we'll now discuss four of the wildly acknowledged elements of the picture. We'll be discussing language, we'll be discussing plot, we'll be discussing mood, and then setting. By uh, an imagery analogy with regards to um, building a house. So um, when a house is to be built, you require certain uh, apparatus, you require to be present before the project might it's concrete or clay bricks. We will need wood to do stuff like your scaffolding, your doors, your windows, and certain things in the house, including wardrobes. We also need nails, which are in trigger in working with wood. As you use the nails to hold the wood together, you require a certain number of things, including wires, electric wires, and, stuff like that, and many other things. Um, these things are absolutely important in completing a building project. Um, you cannot imagine a house that doesn't have block. You cannot imagine a house that doesn't have roof because it is not going to be a house. In that way, a literary work must have certain elements. Um, these are well known as elements of the future and they are things that are integral to a literary work in itself. These are things that define the work and not just to glamorize it, but to give it meaning, the meaning that you're looking for in the literary work is found in the element of the future. So elements of literature are analytical tools which are useful in understanding literary works. So these analytical tools are what helps us understand what you're reading. Um, as we discussed last week, one of the um, objectives of or the importance of literature is that it um, helps uh, readers to learn to analyze stories, to analyze to see things from different perspectives. And um, one of the tools for doing that is elements of literature, because these elements of literature give you the idea of um, what you're reading and how to digest what you're reading. Now, even though um, elements of literature might be used in a variant of ways, uh, uh, it, there's no hard and fast rule as to how any given author or poet or playwright should use elements of literature in their work. Um, there's no formula, there's no standard. However, the important thing is that these elements must be found in any given literary work at any given point in time. So uh, um, the important thing is that you, you must find it in a work. It must not present itself to you in a particular format. You cannot expect to see it in a manner that you expect it to be seen. It is totally at the author's discretion to decide how to use this element of future, right? But the important thing is that they must be there for that try work to have any meaning that can be appreciated by the readers. These elements are the bedrock of um, all literary works as they provide the foundation that the work is built on. As you come to see in the course of this lesson, you will see how this plays out in different genres. But uh, uh, the important thing is to understand that elements of literature are integral to literary works because they are the bedrock, they are the four ingredient, ingredients used in um, uh, developing literary works. Now, um, before we proceed, and even though we're not going to be dealing one part of the next sentence, I want to point out that um, elements of literature is not the same thing as literary devices. Elements of literature is not the same thing as literary devices. So uh, uh, what I mean is that um, 
they follow things we'll be discussing today and then the rest that we'll be discussing, discussing next week is very different and should not be confused with what are known as literary devices which um, uh, in more ways than one an embellishment to literary works um we we'll come to discuss literary devices in the coming weeks but i want you to have a look at the front of your mind that um what i discussed today is elements of literature and should them come with it and literary devices and with that we move to the first um element we are discussing today which is language so language is a system of communicating ideas and feelings through signs sounds and or maths essentially um language is a means of communication it's the means that we share our ideas human beings are such animals in the sense that we conceptualize things we have ideas we have thoughts about almost everything However, it is one thing that's one thing that sets us apart from other life forms, which is this, this capability to host ideas, to conceptualize, and then the ability to communicate these ideas and concepts with our um, colleagues, with other human beings. Now, language is this means of communication. It is the vehicle in which communication is driven. Um, it is crucial as one of the core goals of literary works is to communicate ideas, concepts, experiences, story, and stories with an audience. So, um, as we discussed last week, um, one of the importance of literature, uh, one of the uh, roles and the objectives of literature is to introduce readers to different perspectives, to give you expression, so you experiences have perceived for you might have experienced before. So, uh, uh, to be able to do that, the author must be able to communicate with the reader. In automatically able to make the reader see or understand what he is saying. He should be able to, um, the reader should be able to read or perceive what is being shown to him by the author or the poet or the playwright and grasp the core idea, the core concepts being discussed in the literary work. Um, so, where the ideas are not imparted in an audience, though a message was sent out, communication has not occurred. So, um, where an author has written a work or a playwright has directed a work or a poet has written a poem, but these literary works are not understood by the persons who they are performed for or where they are written for, uh, uh, it loses its meaning, it loses its value because essentially it's only, um, it, it might not even entertain, it's merely an engagement of the author and the readers or the listeners or the um, audience were not engaged or they didn't gain anything from that experience. Um, so, for example, if a, if we are, if any one of us on this call now or anybody watching now on average, I'm imagining that um, uh, this person, watch, the person watching is Nigerian and you give them a, a, a novel in Russia, they will not be able to understand it. They can't even read it. So, the core concept or ideas or themes are discussed in that work will be lost on them because they didn't read it in the first place. If any of us listens to a poem in uh, Mandarin, we'll not be able to grasp this because you cannot speak Mandarin unless you have the proficiency in Chinese language or in Mandarin to understand not just the literary meaning of the words, but also the figurative and contextual meanings, you might not grasp the poem. Now, um, um, English language was employed by the author Chino Achebe in writing things fell apart, and this enabled his third brother reach an appreciation. This is uh, particularly important given the fact that um, uh, the author said that his core purpose in the time of writing things fell apart was to write a work that other people that should show the Western countries, that should show our Brenner master that or before they came, that Africa was made up of civilizations and communities who had complex ideas, who had complex uh, existence. Because at the time of colonialism, the British masters or the colonial masters, uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't just England that colonized Africa. But the colonial masters had this misguided belief that Africans were simplistic beings that didn't have any purpose before their coming. They, 
felt that they had done something for Africans by giving us education, by giving us some sort of structure. So Achebe's purpose at the time of writing this for the heart was to pass across the idea that oh, before it came, Africa was existing, before it came, communities were existing in Africa, and they had their ideologies, they had their culture, and they had their traditions, and they had their own way of life. So it's he, he are trying to use English language as this message across. Now, this is important in two ways. One, well, we're meeting it here. One is that um, it enabled the Western reader to be able to understand what was written on the paper. It was important for the Western people who he wrote this book for to be able to read the text and understand the story he was telling them. So if this book, Since for Life was, was written in Igbo, it wouldn't have crossed the borders of Nigeria, except the person who did it across the borders of Nigeria is an Igbo person who can understand Igbo language, which would ordinarily limit the reach of the world. Also, English language sort of made the book relatable, as you'll we'll see in the next slide. So um, as I look at here, the first purpose of language is to make the work, um, communi to communicate the work to the reader. Um, also, um, even though Tinsu Lapato was written in English language and had a wide audience across the globe at the time of this publication, and in the more than 60 years since its publication, it has also been translated to, into at least 100 languages, which has also widened this reach. Which is why if you go on the internet and you search things for the part, you will see versions of it in Portuguese, in Spanish, in French, in Italian. And you will see uh, publications made by people who have read this work and have been moved or have come to understand the Igbo culture based on the text or, or the story told in things for the part. Um, language, however, goes beyond communication of ideas that we have discussed in the previous slide. It also touches on the manner and the effect of that communication. It's not just about how the reader read, reads the text and understands it literally. It's also how this language could inflect or affect the, the, the communication. So, for example, in Tense for Apart, um, Igbo words and pigeon phrases were used at several times in the book. Um, and even though the Igbo proverbs were translated into English in the time of writing, you could still feel the Igbo ness, you could still feel the Igbo culture carried along in the pages of the book. So um, you see words like Ezimbo, like Chi, like Yes, like Obanje used across the book. And it, 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 the teacher was expert in the way he used these words because as he used them, he sort of like described them in an explanatory way that the Western reader would understand what he was saying. Now, this did um, two things. It um, introduced the reader to Igbo language and by extension the Igbo culture. So uh, in the course of reading this book, um, people who are from who originally didn't speak Igbo language knew about words like Ezebo, Chi, Yesa. And these are things that, these are words that they ordinarily wouldn't have met in their ordinary communication with their um, compatriots. But in reading the text, they have come to see these words as things, as language of the Igbo person at the time that since all apart was written. Now, this also highlights the background uh, and the setting of the characters. So it helps the readers to put themselves in the mindset or in the perspective of the characters who they are reading their stories. So for example, when um, uh, um, we read about Ezema, we discover the Obanje phenomenon. We not just we don't just meet the world, we meet the Obanje phenomenon and then its meaning and how it plays across Igbo culture. So this is the second thing that language does in the course of um, in the literary work. First of all, it communicates the ideas literally by giving the reader the opportunity to understand the text written on the paper or to understand what is being said to them. Secondly, it communicates in such a way that it gives some context to uh, the literary work being perceived or being read. The next literary uh, element of literature is um, plots. Um, The next element of literature is plot. 
So plot is essentially the gist of the story. It's essentially what the whole literary work is about. So it is a sequence of events that occurs from the first sentence of the work to the end. So um, if I said that the Bible is a literary work, so um, from the, in the beginning was the world and the world was with God and the world was God. John starts telling a story that ends at the last sentence. Genesis chapter one starts telling a story that ends at the last stage of revelation. In that way, like that is the plot of the story. Now, things fell apart, starts out with um, us meeting Okonkwo and his father, and how Okonkwo has, over the course of several years, tried to distinguish himself from his father. That sets the tone for the story, and then the story transposes all the way over um, more than 10 chapters to um, Okonkwo's death. That is the plot of the story. That is the gist. In common parlance, that is the gossip. So when a fight breaks out on the street and you're walking past and you ask somebody, oh, what is happening here? What they tell you is the plot of the story. The people fighting are the characters. The place the fight is breaking out is the setting. However, the plot of the story is essentially what caused the fight. Why are they fighting? Who threw the punch first? Who was beating more? Who is bleeding? And stuff like that. That's the plot of the story. That's the gist of the story. That's essentially the story itself. Now. Though the presentation of a plot is slightly different for each genre, it is present in all the trial works. Um, what, I, what is meant here is that um, plot is not restricted to prose, plot is not restricted to drama. Um, in the way that Okonkwo's story trans, trans, um, transitioned from the first chapter to the end, uh, you could have stories being told in drama. For example, um, uh, um, The Gods Are Not to Blame, uh, um, our husband has come mad again. These are drama works that have plot in it in the sense that it tells you a story that happens over a course of a period of time. And even though it's in prose form, it's still a plot in its own. Also, poetry still has plot. Um, although the plot in poetry might be a little bit more time constrained, as in that it is shorter than a typical plot in prose or drama. But, Poems have plot regardless. So you tell you a story. Maybe they're telling a story about a rain, you're telling a story about a girl that is being courted, or you're telling a story about a boy. Also, a story regardless. So all the way these plots are presented as plots can take can take different sequences in the sense that it doesn't have to be in a chronological order. Things can happen at several times. The important thing is that it makes sense to the reader. However, in long form works as prose and drama, um, such as things fall apart, plots could take the following formats. It could have a beginning exposition or introduction. In prose work or novels, this is what you usually meet as a prologue. And then in chapter one, and then you progress as the story moves along to the last chapter, and then the epilogue. Also, the story will have conflict, uh, which is essentially what introduces the excitement in the story. It will have rising action, which is essentially how the story progresses from the first chapter of the prologue, with, um, depending on the circumstances, as it progresses, and then reaches a point where. Um, depending on the story, depending on the plot, there is a climax. So climax is the point where um, the story has hit its highest point. There's a catharsis or conflict has reached its crescendo and then things start going down again. And that's the falling action until you reach a resolution and denouement. Essentially, this is the epilogue. And it's at this point that some sort of equilibrium is introduced into the story. So, for example, uh, in Things Fall Apart, the story starts out with us meeting Okonkwo and his father, who is late at the time of the story is being told. However, he plays a strong role on Okonkwo and then the story on itself um, over the expanse of the plot. Now, the story progresses to when Omofia uh, calls a meeting to handle an um, alteration with a neighboring community. And then this progresses to the point where um, goes to war with his police and comes back to GKMFUNA and then we meet him all year and then we have the 
incidents. I, I'm sure, I, I know that some persons watching this um, video might not have read the books. So I'm going to try and use as many spoilers as possible. But essentially, because of the story, there are several things happening at different times. And at the point that Ikeme Funa is killed, and then at the end of the story, there is there are short bursts of climax, climatic events taking place. Then you have the rising action, which uh, was what led to Ikeme Funa's death. And then Ikeme Funa's death being like a sort of climax in the sense that it is what set the stage for the things that happen in the later parts of the book. And then you have the falling action that sort of like um, was a snowballing effect on how Okonko makes its end at the last chapter of the book. So the next element to be discussing is mood. Essentially, the mood of a literary work is the emotion or feeling being evoked by it. Um, as we discussed in the last session, um, one of the core goals of literature is to introduce you to different experiences, different concepts, different ideas, different perspectives. And in the course of doing this, uh, the author might employ mood and you might be driven to experience this mood that he has employed in the course of the work. This could be sadness, anger, happiness, fear, or even a state of awareness such as ignorance. So uh, it, this is not limited. Like I said, the core elements themselves are things that are important, but the way they present is not, it doesn't have to pass through as the way they present in any literary work. So essentially, um, the literary work will make you realize that you do not know enough about a particular subject and thus evoke an emotion for you to reveal to you that oh, oh, this could happen to you. And depending on how this, how the events in the book went about, you could be scared for your life, or you could be happy that there's a potential um, good will. Uh, depending on what happened in the story, essentially, like it tries. It sort of transposes the mood from the literary work to the reader or the audience expressing the work. Now, while there might be a general mood related to literary work, the mood might change in the course of the story with each chapter. Essentially, as the story progresses, the mood may change, putting the reader's anticipation and changing also at the point of the climax. So, as I give a short description of a short summary of the plot in this solar part. So let's take an example from chapter one, the reader is drawing you, I can put it if you need to conquer, and depending on how you are appreciable of the character, you might like the character at that point to see him as a manly, emulatable character. And then you meet an Oka, and then you, you are abhorred by his laziness, and then you, uh, you encounter the conflict, and you are driven to rage, and then you, uh, you read how the how Okonkwa's village had gone to the neighboring village and come back with two slaves, essentially Okonkwa and the girl. So as you read these different parts of the story, you might be driven to different emotions, depending on how these events play out in your perception or how you react to them. But this does not change that the fact that the overall mood of the book is usually one or two things. So, for example, in terms of the overall mood was a somber sadness. Was this somber um, awareness that oh, this is just sad? There are sad events happening at almost every given turn of the story. Even though at several points there was excitement, there was joy, there was uh, a festival, and and and, and then like small small things happening in between the the the, the exposition and then the denouement, right? But the general mood still was sadness. Okay, yes, I've discussed this last point, which was the, the feeling that Okonkwo had for his father, hatred. So though the mood, more, so the mood of the book morphs and changes as the characters face different situation, the story is embedded in a somber mood that accumulates in sadness when it moves from the his death and then at the end of the book. The internet by the other may drive them to use certain devices and an understanding of elements of mood is pivotal understanding the experiences of characters and successfully analyzing the story subjectively. So yes, this is why mood is important in the course of um, analyzing a literary work because it gives you the opportunity or it gives you the tool to 
with a self in the character sheet and feel what they felt, which might have given the, the rea their reactions to the events that, that took place. So for example, depending on how well you read things for apart or and how appreciable you are to Okufo at the beginning of the of this of the of the novel. At the end, when um Okufo meets his demise, he might be experiencing intense sadness or regret or anger, depending on how you see the, the events around surrounding his death. And that is one of the key ways that literature achieves its goal, which is to make um, the reader or the or the audience embedded into the story, so that you can put yourself in the in the character shoes, not just the author's shoes, and feel what they felt. Now, this becomes important in the course of writing your exams, as it will enable you to put yourself in the shoes of the author and analyze the story or the poem or the drama uh, subjectively. To just to respond to the questions um, more directly. So the last element we'll be discussing today is setting. So this essentially the time and the location in which a literary work is set, in which a literary work takes place. So this is essentially the location and is the background against which the action, which is the plot in the literary work takes place. Now, though things fall apart was written in 1958, it was set more than 50 years in the past at the time of writing, which is at the peak of colonialism in Southeast Nigeria. This is important as it gives you the opportunity to put yourself in the shoes of the characters and for you to understand that oh, the, event, the events um, described in this book took place at a certain point when there was no school, when Christianity was being introduced in Nigeria when um, girls are not allowed to um, uh, go to school, they were not given, they were a, there was a wide range of limitations on the, on different people, not just women, but especially on women. So this gives you the opportunity to understand the characters and hence the story with a, a, a subjective view. It sort of enables you to see things from their view and not from yours. So for example, if you read things for apart with the idea that it was written in 2019 and then it was set in 2015, you will judge the characters differently. Uh, you will not uh, react to the way you would react if this, the way that the story was written originally. So the time and the setting is important in understanding the literary work. Also, if the story was set at the same time, which is 50 years, maybe in 1900s, and then it was set in India. The story would have been totally different from what we read in Central Apart. So you see the role that setting plays on editorial work. It sort of grounds the story. It sort of gives it a better star on which the characters and then every other part of the, um, every other element of literature takes place. And then the work sort of like becomes an embodiment of what the author wants it to be. So the setting depicts the world and realities of the characters in any literary work, which also impacts other elements of which I think I've discussed it. So uh, uh, essentially, because setting is the core factor, it sort of like sets the stage for every other thing. So because Things All Apart is set in uh, early, late 1800s or early 1900s in Southeast Nigeria, you have the characters speaking Igbo. You have the characters bearing Igbo names. You have the characters uh, uh, embodying ideas and concepts such as Obanje and Osu and Ovu. Even though these things might not have played out uh, as an integral, integral part of the story, but these are core concepts that are embellishing the story. Now, the setting of the story also um, helps the reader understand why the society is largely patriarchal, why traditional religion was practiced in the story, and then how it was okay for a came to be taken away from his family, from his family and taken to a whole different community, and they subsequently killed. So you see that certain plays and it's important when you sense that it is the foundation, it sort of like sets the stage for every other element of it.
characteristic of a typical community in the era that the story was set. This information helps the reader understand the patriarchal society and the complex system of leadership invoked at the time. So yes, I didn't touch on this part, but um, at the time that since we were part of it, there, are, there was basically no king in the, you know, and then no point C that the king was uh, uh, mentioned or referred to as an habitat or, or somebody who made it in any matter whatsoever. So it sort of like gives me the idea of where the product is coming from, what kind of society the story is set in, which drives the story. For La Paz. A man's life from death to death was a series of traditional rights which brought him nearer and nearer to his death. I will draw a relation to a correlation to this, which is not intended by the author, by the way, but I have found it metaphorical for the way um, we study literature. So, for that to the end of the subject and then to done. Um, if there are no questions, then I, I think the, I'm done on my end. So, thank you very much. Question, Okay, hi, Joshua. Uh, oh, hi, sir. All those uh, elements of uh, literature, are they applicable to all the journeys of literature or only drama alone? Okay, yes, thank you. Um, I think I mentioned at the, uh, at the introductory part of the, the topic that yes, they apply to every genre of literature. So in the same way that you have a setting for and for drama, you also have a setting for poem because a poem is usually set in some place. It might not be as tangential or as physical uh, in to his poem mistress that early 90s in, uh, in a Western country. For example, um, um, even in songs, like even in songs that are popular now, or even in our folk songs, which although they don't fall into what we discuss as literature in English, but every given uh, genre of literature, of literature is applicable to all of them. The way it's applicable might differ, but they are all applicable. So you have a mood, a poem makes you feel a poem from the, the subject progresses will be some of the books with this um all genres of literature have elements of hello joshua yes sir thank you very much sir thank you I don't know if there are any other questions. No, that's all for now, sir. Okay, thank you very much. So I am done for today. I expect to see us next so we can finalize elements of future. We'll be discussing the remaining elements next week. And I hope we will gain a better grasp of how they apply across the areas of future and in the ways they differ from the trade devices. So thank you very much. Um, Goodbye.